Uh, I'm John Edmiston. I've been doing cyber ministry since 1991. Uh, I'm one of the pioneers and I keep trying to solve problems uh, out there, particularly in the space of missions, but also in the space of local church. Uh, I teach on the theology of technology. I teach on internet evangelism uh, I, and internet discipleship. I'm also teaching a course on mobile ministry uh, that's coming up. So I'm both a, um, I, I taught under Ryan Bolger at Fuller for a little while, as far as in his uh, uh, lecture earlier, and uh, I taught at Asian Theological Seminary, various seminaries around the place. But I have my own ministry called Cyber Missions. Uh, and that's, like I said, been in existence since 1991, but it was had a different name then. And uh, so one of the problems that I am looking, I'm actually looking at a couple of problems, but the main problem I'm looking at is how to train global pastors for under $300 a year each. So, because they've only got an income of $3,000 a year, they can only spend $300 a year getting a full-time education. How can we deliver that to their mobile phone? How can we deliver that to their internet cafe in the area? Uh, how can we get them a theological education of some quality on a digital device? But also, as a corollary to that, we're finding that theological education is coming, whether we like it or not, to the local church. And the local church is being disrupted by this digital invasion that Ryan Bolger and others were talking about. And it's not working the same way as it was. So we've got this enormous challenge. The gospel is now everywhere except the local church. It's on print, it's on TV, it's on radio, it's on internet, it's on YouTube, uh, it's on satellite TV, uh, and it's, it's everywhere else. Now, when I started on in internet ministry back in the early 90s, uh, there was opposition, uh, and funnily enough, from the Reverend Ian Paisley in Northern Ireland. He was the leader of the free Protestants. Uh, they're the ones that were blowing up the Catholics with bombs. Uh, and he was very aggressive, very fiery. And he came out and said, the gospel should not be preached except by an ordained minister in the local church. That was as far as he was concerned, that was the only place the gospel should be preached, is by an ordained minister in a local church. And there is a lot of that thinking still left. When I talked to pastors groups, I talked to a group of Calvary Chapel pastors a couple of years ago, they were shocked by the idea of someone coming to Christ online. And yet they of all denominations have a lot of radio ministry. Uh, and there's lots of people going out uh, on radio sharing the gospel, but they're shocked about the idea of people coming to Christ. Now, Global Media Outreach, which is run by some friends of mine from Silicon Valley, uh, it sees millions of people coming to Christ each year online. And back in 1994, 1995, when I first went into internet evangelism, I was seeing four or five people a day coming to Christ. And because I was in Australia at the time, uh, I would, they would mainly came to uh, Christ when I was asleep because they were people in other countries. And so I'd wake up in the morning and find four or five commitments to Christ while I slept. And I was seeing 1,500 people a year coming to the Lord. Now, as a, as a Bible teacher and as a nerd, as, as definitely not an evangelist, seeing 1,500 people coming to Christ each year was a revolution for me. Never happened before. Generally, 50 people was a really good year, you know? <laughs> Suddenly it was 1,500. Uh, and so uh, I was seeing an explosion in my evangelistic capability for a simple page with the Roman road on it, a response form down the bottom. Uh, and so people who were doing internet evangelism are seeing these huge results. And this is very disruptive because when I say to a local church pastor, hey, I saw a thousand people come to Christ last year and they see six. You imagine the, 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 how their minds are going. Uh, this can't be real, they can't be real results, but they are real results. Uh, and so the, the local church is getting very upset. Uh, and so there's still enormous resistance in the local church to internet ministry. Uh, now, what can happen online, and Ryan Bolger to, uh, in the last session uh, did some of this, but I, I'm putting it more in layman's language. One, one of the things we, can fi we find is that now we can go through most of the stages of the Christian life. For instance, you can make a faith commitment to Christ online. You can go to any of the, uh, you can go to my website or any of the global media outreach websites or the numerous internet evangelism websites and make a faith commitment to Christ. Just as you can read the Bible and come to Christ, you can read the Bible online and come to Christ. 
not a problem. Uh, you can go through a Roman road presentation or a falling place presentation uh, and make a faith commitment to Christ. You can then go and make your Christian friends on Facebook or any of the social media sites. You can read and study the Bible from a website. I use bluedatabible.com all the time, or .org, bluedatabible, uh, uh, Bible Gateway, all the numerous Bible study sites. We have multiple translations. You can consult the Greek and the Hebrew, uh, and, and we use them. There's Bible apps for your cell phone. Uh, uh, so you can read and study the Bible from a website or from an app. You can hear first-class preaching on YouTube. Uh, you can go to my local church and you can hear me preach or you can go to YouTube and hear someone better. Uh, uh, and so they're going to YouTube and they're listening to John Piper, they're listening to John MacArthur, uh, uh, but they're also listening to prosperity gospel preachers and people talking about UFOs. So there's, there's a whole uh, input there from a very wide range of, of <coughs> preachers on YouTube. You can get your worship music on Spotify or iTunes. Uh, I love Spotify. I get uh, all these diverse things that I can uh, find for worship music. I also like classical music, so I can hunt around Spotify for great classical music that also has a faith basis to it uh, and get stuff that I actually like because I can't stand Hillsong. Uh, so, despite being an Australian. Uh, so I don't like the plasticky Christian music, so I find worship music that I actually like and can tolerate. Uh, but there are people who like the more contemporary music and they will go on Spotify and find the more contemporary music that suits them. Uh, uh, you can send out your prayer points on Twitter. In fact, I send out a prayer points very regularly. I have a, a group of 130 people in an email list. Every week I send out my own prayer points. This is a far cry from my early days as a missionary, whereas to send out a prayer letter used to take three months. I used to have to handwrite it, give it to a typist. The typist would type it up. The typist would then send it down to Melbourne. I was in Papua New Guinea. The Melbourne would headquarters would appre uh, approve my uh, prayer letter. It would be then sent back to Papua New Guinea. We would, then we would hand crank out 500 copies <laughs> with uh, one of those hand crank uh, what do you call it? I can't even remember what they're called. You used to have a stencil on them. Mimeographs, uh, mimeographs yeah. Uh, and then you would put them in envelopes and post them back to Australia because they'd read prayer letters if the stamp was from Papua New Guinea. And this would take three or four months, so you would do your Christmas prayer letter in September, by which time it was totally out of date. Uh, but now we can send out our prayer points on Twitter or on email. You can find a Christian wife or husband on christianmingle.com. In fact, my wife and I met on the internet, but not on that particular site. Uh, my wife and I met on my website, because <laughs> it was a, a website that I had. And so we got married in 2001. Uh, I was a typical bachelor nerd uh, uh, with the pizza boxes and the coffee cups and, and all that. And she's a botanist. Uh, she's a PhD in botany. Uh, she, so she was a typical nerd. Uh, in her own field. Uh, in the ministry side, what can we do online? We can do any numerous internet-based Bible college courses or distance education seminary courses. Liberty offers free ones for uh, people who don't want to pay, but they're just ordered only. Uh, and there's uh, things like Trinity, there's the Fuller online courses, there's the new online courses that Biola is getting up under Ron Hannaford, who I think is speaking next door. Uh, and you can get a legal valid ordination certificate online for five dollars because there's no there's a separation of church and state so the government has no regulation of ordination so you can get ordained to the church of you know whatever whatever and the government you, you can then get all the tax exemptions you like because the government can't say it's a valid or an invalid ordination uh, and uh, so you can get ordained online. You can write a book and get it published on Amazon using CreateSpace or any of the uh, published on demand or ebook uh, distribution services such as, and there are, and there are many of them. Uh, there's of course the, the Amazon e ebook services, but there's, there are others as well, which has just escaped my mind. But there are a dozen or so different ebook publishing services out there. Uh, you can register as a 501c3 online Christian ministry. That's what I've done. That's what Side Missions is. It's a 501c3. It's an online ministry. 
uh, and the government grants it tax exemption. It took a long while, but it, we got it. Uh, you can recruit volunteers via christianvolunteering.org run by my friend Andrew Sears out of Boston. They've placed something like a few hundred thousand or maybe over a million Christian volunteers through their website. Uh, and I got 14 of them in six months at one point. Wonderful help. I can collect donations via PayPal, in fact I do. And if you want to do charity, you can take the money you've collected by PayPal and send it to missionaries in Africa uh, uh, who send you a video about what they do, which may, be, may or may not be true. You can do all this ministry without ever darkening the doorway of a local church. You can do this without ever being baptized, without ever taking communion, without ever belonging to a denomination, without ever teaching Sunday school or taking any responsibility in the local church, without meeting with a pastor, without actually meeting another Christian face to face or giving to a local church. We can do all that stuff we've just mentioned without ever going to church. Why bother? So the digital age is making the church increasingly less relevant. Why do I have to go to that building at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning when I can do it all online anyway? When I can share my faith online, when I can study online? Why bother being under the authority of a pastor who might well may be less educated than I am? Uh, and particularly if someone who's a doctor or a businessman, someone who's busy, someone who's a schedule that uh, uh, precludes Sunday mornings, uh, or someone who is easily offended, and there are a lot of people like that, pastor makes some statement, they get offended, they walk out of church, and now they, they live an online Christian existence. So, what about church discipline? Nowadays, you can, you can sleep around, you can do drugs, you can get drunk, and no one's going to know about it because they don't know you except through your Facebook profile, which is carefully manicured. So you can do what you like in the online world, privately, your private life is private, it doesn't appear. You can preach, teach and believe almost any doctrine you like with minimal correction. I mean, you see these people on uh, YouTube and they go on there and they're saying, well, you know, the, these UFOs are coming soon and this prophecy is going to be fulfilled and they teach the wackiest doctrine under the sun, very convincingly. And no one, no denominational board is coming to them and saying, what you spoke to on YouTube is complete heresy. It's a violation of all the scriptures uh, and we're taking away your preaching license. There's no preaching license anymore. They can preach what they like on YouTube. So they can preach against the Trinity. They can go, go and say that uh, everyone is now saved uh, and there's no regulation of preaching at all, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, and so there's... You can, you can, there is no consequences for what people are saying. You can ver verbally abuse people online, then vanish. We all have these trolls that appear on their Facebook page or something like that, tell us that we're a heretic and vanish, or, or the, in the old uh, chat room days, they would appear and abuse you and vanish off into the thing. Now, in my early days of the, on the internet, uh, I published an article that said how to discern a revival. It was a very neutral, safe article. I thought I didn't think there was much in it at all. I just said this is how, how you can discern a true revival and a false revival. These manifestations are generally valid. These are not valid. Uh, this is how you can scripturally, emotions okay, but it has to be within these parameters. I thought it was a very neutral article. Well, I got, in the space of six months, something like 200 email death threats. I had a stack of death threats on my folder, folder on my desk this thick. And I nearly went to the Australian authorities and said, hey, you know, I want protection. Mainly they came from people in the laughter movement. Uh, you know, the holy laughter movement. Now, I'm not against the holy laughter movement. I'm a Pentecostal. <laughs> uh, I've been an AG pastor and a Foursquare pastor. I'm quite charismatic. I speak in tongues. I do the healing thing. Uh, swing off the chandeliers a little bit. Uh, As so I'm not, I'm not against revival, and I didn't think it was an extreme article, but there were some very extreme people out there, and they sent me death threat after death threat. Uh, uh, and so uh, there are some very mentally <laughs> unstable people out there in cyberspace. Uh, eventually, that just sort of faded away. Uh, but there's some incredibly abusive people and they can get away with it. 
You can drift away from a cyber church or even a normal church without anyone caring too much. You can become a Christian and then six emails later, drift away, and how does anyone follow you up? You can make outrageous prophecies and rip people off by the thousands with very little likelihood of any serious legal action ever. Now, this happened particularly in the Y2K thing, which uh, 1999 was all these people all over the internet saying, you have to buy your survival gear from our website because this bug in the COBOL programming is going to bring down the world and with the date change all the computers are going to go down and you're not going to get any electricity or any food and I don't know if you remember the Y2K scare but it was big and people were, were making hundreds of thousands of dollars selling, you know, baked, tin baked beans to gullible Christians or something so that they would have three weeks supply of wheat and water, etc. and you'd have to buy their barrels. And, and it was a scam. Uh, and it came and it went uh, and people made a lot of money and no one had any legal consequences for that. Okay, here, here, let's ask some questions that I get asked as both as a pastor and an online person. Uh, why bother going to church when I can just worship at home? I can find that wonderful Christian music, I can listen to it at home, I can worship the Lord, I can go to YouTube. Why do I have to get into my car and drive to a church when I can just worship at home with a few friends? Why should I go to the prayer meeting when I can tweet my prayer points? Now, our church... Uh, has text-based prayer ministry. Uh, and it's a good thing. People text their prayers into our intercessors prayer group, which meets on Wednesday night and Saturday mornings. And since we made a text number available for prayer points, the number of prayer points coming in has, has exploded. Also, we, when the, if it's an urgent matter, as soon as the text comes in, it's tweeted out to myself, the other associate pastors and elders, and we all pray uh, on the spot for that. Uh, why should we accept local church discipline when the world is my church and I have Christian friends in everywhere. You know, like, okay, so I'm having an affair with someone that's completely inappropriate. I'm not, but this is the person, right? <laughs> but someone's having an affair with someone that's completely inappropriate. Uh, and, uh, but what's the, the business of the local church, people say? You know, I've got my friends and, you know, there's grace. So why should the church discipline me uh, for being out of line? And so church discipline has now become almost impossible. It is not now almost impossible for a pastor to bring correction on a serious moral matter uh, because uh, A, they will be lambasted on Facebook. Uh, the, uh, I know of a church in, uh, in an area where I, a church I used to preach regularly in where the pastor decided to correct someone for running a marijuana dispensary shop with all the... Uh, uh, now he found out his worship leader was selling marijuana and the appliances to go with smoking marijuana. This person got the friends together on Facebook. These friends and, and this person then sued the church, dragged the pastor through court, humiliated the pastor in the local media, uh, and, and just made that pastor's life hell. Uh, for, uh, for trying to stop drug sales by the worship leader. Uh, that's where we're at. And Facebook's now being used as a means of vengeance by ticked off people against the pastor. Why give 10% of my income when I can get the same wonderful information for free on YouTube? And I confess, I've thought that thought myself. <laughs> Why am I paying 10% of my income for a 45 minute sermon uh, from someone else? Well, I was attending a mega church for a number of years. I was very busy in ministry. Uh, my wife is a, a teacher. She's extremely busy. We just wanted a church where we could sit and be no one for a while. Uh, and so we went to this mega church and I thought, why am I giving any income to this mega church? I'm going there, no one talks to me, I, which was the sort of idea. We go and sit in the pew, get a 45 minute message that wasn't that crash up, which I could have done better myself or got on, on, on YouTube. Uh, and go home, why is that 45 minute, minute message worth 10% of my income? 
And frankly, my wife and I said, it isn't worth that, we didn't tithe. <laughs> but that was the thought. We gave a certain amount to that church, but we didn't tithe to that church. We gave to our missionary friends around the world. We tithed eventually, but we tithed a total, but we gave our money elsewhere because we didn't think that we were getting much out of that church. Um, why should I believe the pastor's theology over my own theology or Prophet Bob's theology or the guy on the uh, internet's theology? Why should I believe the pastor's theology first and foremost just because I'm sitting in his pew? When the electronic world, the internet world has given me so many alternative theologies to choose from. Uh, why should I ever bother with church membership or denominational loyalty? Hey, I'm loyal to my friends on Facebook. I'm loyal to uh, connections. I'm loyal to my network. I'm not really loyal to my church or my denomination. In fact, a lot of people are barely aware of the denomination that they belong to. Uh, I know certainly in our church, very few members have any idea that we're a four square church. Or, and that if they are aware that we're a four square church, they have very little idea of what the four square denomination is about. And the senior pastor there uh, keeps bringing in four square people to try and get that idea across, but it still isn't present very far. If you asked us what sort of a church we are, they'd say, oh, we're a Filipino church, which is what we are, my wife's Filipino. Uh, and so they would identify with being a Filipino church far more than they identify with being a four square church. Uh, uh, why should we put up with uh, church gossip? Why should we put up with hurtful people? I'm much safer online. And this is becoming an increasingly huge issue. It's now getting to the point where I have to give, the world has become so unsafe or is perceived as being so unsafe that we now have a filter up and say, you can't relate to me unless I explicitly give you permission to relate to me. So that marketer that rings up at six o'clock in the evening uh, trying to sell me um, renovations to my home, I'm increasingly angry at that person, not because they rang me at six o'clock, but because I haven't given them permission to relate to me. And in fact, my phone is a, a, a phone that's uh, on the do not call list, the government, you know, do not call list. And I say, please remove me from your database. I'm on the FTC do not call list. I've put myself there and you can do that yourself. But I want people, only people who have permission to relate to me, to relate to me. And the younger you get, the more this is the case. So that uh, if a person's a lady, the only person that should phone her is her boyfriend or husband. Uh, that has become the social standard. And when Ryan said that you, we should relate to people under 18 and, and hang out with them online, uh, I, I had to respond earlier that he would get a lot of people arrested with that advice. If you're a school teacher and you relate to someone on, uh, under 18 on Facebook, you are automatically fired. If you do it too many times, you'll be charged. Uh, uh, that's LAUSD school policy. Uh, and as a youth pastor texting or relating to someone under 18 without the parents' permission will be automatically dismissed in most churches. Uh, unless that parent gave permission or else it was understood in the youth group or it was a mass text such as, uh, you know, uh, meet you all at Starbucks at 7.30, that's a neutral text. But anything that's even remotely personal now uh, sends up red flags. Before, five years ago, I could say to someone, uh, I need, we, we have to make an appointment at such and such a time. Uh, tra there may be traffic. Please give me your cell number so that I can connect uh, if there's traffic or if I can connect at the airport. Now, if that person is female, that has implications and is seen as a very wrong and inappropriate thing to do. Uh, I cannot ask someone eat for their cell number, even for a normal meeting kind of situation. Uh, and uh, people will get outraged. So we, we are now in a society where we are very, very protective of our phone numbers, of our email addresses, of our information and of our relationships. And we have to give people permission uh, to relate.
And so the, uh, there is a, a very strong uh, ethic of communication that's going on. And this applies to churches as well. Okay, well, let me, I may have missed something. I may have gone ahead. Okay, uh, why should we put up with go gossip? Why should we put up with relationship? Uh, Nick, besides, I don't want to go to church because I don't want to have to pay for church buildings. I live in a digital world. Uh, I, I will get my training digitally. I will get my information digitally. Why do I have to go to that building and put money in the plate for a piece of infrastructure? Uh, and increasingly churches are hearing that. It's the people that's the church, not the organisation. So I can meet those people on Facebook. I can go and meet them at Starbucks. I can create my own meetings with my brothers and sisters in Christ. We can have a home meeting. Why should I go to a organized church? Besides, I don't like traditional religion. Here, I do like traditional religion, but I'm taking the place of the skeptic. And besides which, there's no difference between clergy and laity, so I don't need the clergy, and everyone's a missionary, so I can share my faith online all over the globe. Now, the yes, we should get rid of the clergy laity distinction to some extent. But there is a difference between informed and uninformed and people who know their theology and people who don't know their theology. I was talking to a young uh, pastor recently and he was doing a church plant and he had no, had no formal theological training. He was a very talented young man, 35 years old. Uh, he had a degree in journalism, a very good communicator, very personable, very passionate about the Lord. And I said, uh, said to him, do you know why you need theology when you're doing a church plant? And he said, oh, well, so the church plant doesn't go off the rails. I said, well, why else do you need theology? And he said, well, I don't know. I said, well, when you plant your church, uh, your leadership team who's going to help you with the church plant will not respect your leadership if you obviously don't know how to open the scriptures. If you don't know how to do proper exegesis, if you don't know the difference between uh, how to teach the Proverbs and how to teach the Epistles, if you don't know how to handle the Bible, your team is not going to respect you and you're quickly going to lose leadership. Secondly, the devil's going to send people along to your church who are theologically equipped, like hyper-Calvinists. And they're going to come in and they're going to argue with you. Or Seventh-day Adventists are going to come in and argue with you about the Sabbath. And if you're theologically equipped, you won't be able to push them out the door. They're going to go in, come in there with prosperity theology or, or false prophecies and call themselves a prophet or apostle. And you won't be able to say, uh, wait a second, uh, and come back to them. So you need theology to define the boundaries of what's acceptable and un unacceptable theology in your church plan. Uh, and so and I went on with a few things like that. And suddenly the light bulb went off and I said, First thing you've got to do is go and read How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Douglas and Fee and understand how to open up the scripture. So he went off and did that. Uh, he downloaded it for free, I think from Scribd or somewhere like that, and read it. And now he's enrolled in the Masters in Theology of Fuller <laughs> because he suddenly realized that theology was important. There is a difference between the trained and the untrained. There is a difference between the, the informed and the uninformed. There may not be a formal difference between clergy and laity. It doesn't matter who's ordained and who's not ordained. But it does matter that you know your stuff or don't know your stuff. Because there are many, many challenges to us in our faith out there in the world. Uh, fifthly, people will say, church is boring and I don't have the time and I'm tired on Sundays and I can do internet church late at night and drink coffee. So, hey, I'm going to sleep in on Sunday morning and I'll download the sermon anyway from the church website. Uh, and go over it again. Now, one of the reasons that I create these awful PowerPoints that are full of text is because later on at church or some, someone downloads the PowerPoint. Now, a PowerPoint is supposed to be just one image and a few words, uh, and that's the way you're supposed to do PowerPoint. But I'm finding increasingly people download my PowerPoints who have never been at the meeting. They get downloaded all over the world. So the PowerPoint's got to summarize what I'm saying. The PowerPoint's got to say what I'm saying, even if they haven't been in the meeting. And so this PowerPoint will be downloaded in a hundred different countries around the world because lots of people visit my cyber missions website. And then because it's got all the points on it, they can make some sense of it. 
where someone who just puts a, one image after the other to support their dialogue, which is what you're supposed to do with PowerPoint, uh, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. So people are doing internet church late at night. They're getting the PowerPoint. They're getting the video. They're getting the audio. Uh, and they're skipping church. So in the digital world, which is a very free-ranging world, it's creating opposition to certain things that church is perceived as being. So the local church is being threatened by the digital church in certain areas. Firstly, it says there's more rules and obligations to go to church. If I go to church, I've got to dress this way, I've got to put these clothes on, I've got to do this, there's all these obligations, there's tithing stuff, there's this, there's that. I've got to you know, put the, the kids into here and that into there. And so it it's has all this hassle of rules and obligations. People don't want any intrusion on their privacy or personal life. So if I go to church, I might have to be accountable to that pastor or these elders or these church rules, and my privacy might be invaded with, with questions. Church, it looks like you're paying for information that should be free. You're getting the sermon, and it doesn't contain that much information, and you're, and you're throwing a... 10% of your info, uh, income for information really should be free. That's the perception, whether it is a right perception or a wrong perception. People don't want any restriction on their ability to choose their information, beliefs, lifestyle. Why should my spiritual life be restricted by that funny guy in a suit on Sunday morning? Well, I'm free to choose my beliefs. I'm free to choose my lifestyle. I'm free to choose my information. What's the pastor got to do with it? And so people are abandoning church because of that. People don't want anything that wastes their time and driving to church, coming home from church and being at church seems to be a waste of time. People don't want anything that makes prior claims. Well, going back to the previous one about wasting time, I'm a scan reader, like many people in the digital age. I'm also a speed reader. So I can read at least 1,200 words a minute. So I hate video because video takes forever to get to the point. Give me an article, I will scan read it, I'm done with it in two minutes, boom, on to the next article, on to the next blog, scan my Twitter feed, that's interesting, I'll look at that web page, move on, boom, 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 constantly absorbing information. So what do I do on Sunday morning? I get in there, it takes an hour and a half for this guy to go through three points, which I could have got in 45 seconds. Right. So I've spent an hour and a half for 45 seconds worth of information. That is not the kind of information density that I want. I want something a lot faster and church is too slow. Uh, give me the information on a blog or on a few Twitter points and move on. They don't want people that makes any prior, any, uh, something that makes a prior claim on them. They don't want one way communication by authority figures. So we have a selfish online spirituality. So where does this lead? I'm defining the problem before we define the solution. Where is all this taking us down this track? We've got all this uh, communication happening. We've got all this uh, internet spirituality. We've got all this digital information out there. What kind of person is this producing? Firstly, to narcissism, vanity, and self-absorption. The person is creating their own narcissistic, self-centered, self-absorbed spirituality. To isolation and to idiosyncratic, self-assembled faith. Um, so people are cobbling together their faith. There's a little bit of Oprah Winfrey over there, a bit of New Age here, a bit of the uh, law of attraction over there, a bit of Jesus here, but... Uh, uh, we skip this stuff from Paul. It's a bit heavy. Uh, let's forget about the Old Testament. Uh, let's slice and dice. Well, I like the Gospel of John, but I don't really like the Gospel of Matthew, so we'll keep that. And so we have a self-assembled self spirituality. And, uh, well, you know, I think this is right and this is wrong. He says that's wrong. Well, I don't, I'm going to throw that one out the window. Uh, and with this particularly, I find it issues of social justice. Having spent a lot of my life living in the developing world, I am passionate about self social justice. I am passionate about things like sharing. I am passionately anti-materialistic. I'm not your typical right-wing Republican evangelical. I am a left-wing evangelical 
that doesn't fit anywhere on the uh, current spiritual spectrum. I rage against things like money lending, like these guys, these payday loan people that charge huge amounts of money to poor people. I see that as terribly unjust. The average American evangelical just doesn't even think about that issue. I get really, really mad about international capital flows and the way that uh, the, uh, the, the injustice of these huge capital flows and currency exchange rates and things that absolutely demolish poor nations. Uh, I've seen, I saw Indonesia in 1997, the, the currency there was 2,000 to the American dollar. George Soros comes in, plays with the currency, it goes to 10,000 to the American dollar. People lost 80% of their income within a few days. Their food prices and gas prices went through the roof because one man decided to make a lot of money out of speculating on the Indonesian rupiah. Now, that kind of stuff enrages me, but and it's all there in the book of James about paying fair wages to people. And in LA, I don't pay anything less than $15 an hour because I think that's a, survi a survival basic wage. I think it's unjust to pay someone $8 an hour in LA because you can't live on that. You cannot live on $8 an hour in the LA climate. You can't rent. So they're issues for me, but they're not issues in the evangelical world. And they're not issues online. And people can block that out. They can say, well, that doesn't matter to me. I like my Jesus butterflies and I like my rotating crosses and I like my nice encouraging words and I'm going to ignore social justice because it's too uncomfortable and I will assemble a spirituality that leaves me totally selfish. I, I want my BMW. Uh, I, 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 I want to have my feeling of elitism and I want to ignore the poor people because they're messy and horrible and I don't care about the homeless and I'm fine with that. That's what people are saying. And if they go to church and get that challenge, they walk out the door. In online relationships, there's instant intimacy followed by instant rejection. You can go to an online dating site and be bombarded with people uh, wanting to see someone's profile and then they get instantly dissed no don't like it so instant intimacy they fall in love with someone's profile or think they're falling in love they're infatuated and then gone to theological lawlessness and spiritual anarchy which we talked about earlier resistance to criticism feedback and accountability you can't criticize anyone's point of view anymore or bring correction to it to complete lack of denominational authority, which we touched on earlier, to multiple theological sources in a local church, to Bible teaching becoming a freely available commodity of no necessary commercial value. There is no commercial value in Bible teaching. When I grew up many, many years ago, where you could go to Bible teaching camps in Australia, Bible teachers were esteemed. Uh, you would go, you would buy the tapes, you would listen carefully to the exposition of Ephesians by John Stott or someone like that. And that was considered uh, the height of spirituality. Nowadays, as a Bible teacher, and I've got a few bit of Bible qualification, you can't conduct a Bible seminar and get anyone turning up. They're dead. Unless you're talking about end times prophecy or something like that, you can forget teaching the Bible because people can go online, they can get their exposition of Ephesians by someone else. And as a Bible teacher, no one wants Bible teaching anymore. It's, it's gone, it's finished. It's, uh, I have to uh, talk on things like the theology of technology because going and teaching about Romans, no one wants to listen. No one cares. Uh, and the Bible is no longer something that anyone wants to learn. So. Denominational loyalty began to collapse in the 70s with the rise of independent megachurches and has continued ever since. Denominational pr pronouncements on life and doctrine were being widely ignored in the 80s and are completely ignored now. Very interesting thing, after 2001, the 9-11 attacks, the Pope called a meeting of all the heads of all the denominations and all the religions in the world. The Buddhists were there, the Hindus were there, the Protestants were there, the Orthodox were there. And they all came to the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, and they had this big meeting there. 
uh, and they all agreed that no religion would make war on any other religion again. The Hindus would not attack the Muslims, the Muslims would not attack the Hindus, the Protestants would never attack the Catholics, the Catholics would never attack the Protestants. They signed this big thing called Never Again and it made no difference. The Muslims went back to killing the Christians and the Hindus and everyone else went back to what they were doing because the denominational pronouncement of all the denominations in the world had no authority. The internet has completed the demise of the theological role of the denomination as the laity can get their theology from almost anywhere. So who cares what the Archbishop thinks? The most important role of some denominations is now the clergy retirement plan and health benefits. Okay, so we have no longer have any unique information. The unique information role of the local church is rapidly diminishing to almost zero. If people have a theological question, they tend to ask Google instead of asking their busy pastor. I went to my senior pastor and I said to him, uh, uh, Pastor Ken, when is the, how many serious theological questions were you asked in the last 12 months? Now, we're a multi-site church with about 600 members. We have 400 in one campus and 200 in another. Uh, and so it's not a small church. Uh, most of these people are highly educated. A lot of them are nurses, doctors, professionals, people. Uh, a typical Asian community church. Uh, and so uh, I asked him how many, and he said two, and then he went oh, one. So he got 600 highly educated people, and he gets asked one theological question in 12 months. I said, do you know where all the other people ask the theological questions? He said, no. I said, they went to Google. When they wanted to know about the Trinity, they went to Google. When they wanted to know about the Bible's view on homosexuality, they went to Google. When they wa wanted to know about pro why prosperity theology was wrong, they went to Google. They're no longer asking the pastor. The local church pastor is now competing for theological influence with everyone from Joel Osteen to John Piper to Prophet Bob Jones to whatever. And the unique selling point of the local church is now community and not communication or information. So what, where's the meaning of your church and my church? The meaning of the local church is now deeply connected with the meaning of human persons and also what it means to be a Christian and who is in the process of becoming like Jesus. So for me and for many people, the meaning of the church is who I'm becoming by being with these people. Who am I becoming by being with these people? So my wife and I went through this terrible church split with this church with, uh, where I taught regularly, uh, where the pastor was sued by the congregation. We came out of that very wounded. We didn't do church for about four months until we found this church that we're in at the moment. My wife uh, is a very uh, quiet person, very academic. We went to this church and she found a home group on Friday nights that has been tremendously healing for her after the conflict of the previous church. So we are loyal to that church because of who we are becoming as a result of being with those people. That Friday night home group has become enormously significant for me. I don't go to that home group because it talks it all in Tagalog and I don't speak Tagalog very well. But to be with older women of her own age, she spoke Tagalog or own, own culture, who were warm and accepting, that was healing for her. Her spiritual life has gone ahead leaps and bounds as a result of that. I enjoy that church because they asked me to preach, but not too often. My other ministry uh, is very, very hectic. So I'm involved, I'm respected, I'm an elder, I'm there sort of almost an associate pastor. People call me Pastor John, but I'm not supposed to be called Pastor John, but everyone does. Uh, and I enjoy... The fellowship, I enjoy who I'm becoming in that church, and that is what's keeping me at that church. It's not the information, it's who I, what I sense is happening inside me in the process of being loved by those people. And that is what is keeping people at church now, is, hey, I enjoy these people. I enjoy being able to hang out with them and do a Starbucks with them, uh, meet in their homes after church, and I'm becoming a better person by being there. And when we sense that we are changing, that's when we become loyal to church. Uh, now, it comes back to our concept of a human person. Am I just a biological computer, put in information, press a button, I grow? No, I'm not. So if, but if I am, then I can 
get the information in cyberspace and don't have to be at church. But if we're relational and eternal spiritual beings meant to share love, then I need church because I need to be with my brothers and sisters. I have to do those 33 one another commandments, pray for one another, love one another, exhort one another. I have to be there in flesh with them, being rebuked by them, being exhorted by them, having them ask me to do things for them. That becomes part of my existence. And so church needs to treat us as important relational spiritual beings, not just a container to pour information into. So in the old days, you go to church and they would pour information into you in the form of the sermon and you were supposed to memorize your three points and walk out and that was your spiritual transformation or go down the front and be prayed for and that was your spiritual transformation. Now the spiritual transformation is coming out of the process of being together. I suppose it always did, but we never explicitly made it that way. Uh, so where is church unique? What, where, where does church have a selling point where does it have an advantage over a digital church? Right. Now, for a while there, I was in favour of digital churches and I spoke on church online and things like this. Uh, I'm now no longer in favour of digital church, as you can tell. Uh, things like life rituals, weddings, baptisms, funerals, dedications require a community to be part of. There is, a, there is a place for architecture, glory, quiet spaces, retreat centers, connection to history and tradition, connection to family experiences over generations, to communal prayer and anointed worship in the presence of God, even to community support during catastrophe. Our church ha is in a very uh, urban area, so we have a food ministry, a food distribution ministry uh, to people in Section 8 housing uh, next to us. Uh, we have small groups of faith where people can pursue God together, a feeling of being personally known and cared for. This is, all comes out of that being in the local church that cannot come out of being online. So you can put your information online, but your relationship has to be local. So the church has to focus on the relationship and not on the information. It's not the quality of the sermon, it's the quality of the friendships that count. Okay, what do people want from church? They want friends, they want prayer partners, they want spiritual encouragement. Uh, one thing I find, they want a seminar, st seminar style teaching on the difficult topics. I used to do a seminar in San Pedro every Tuesday night. We'd get 50 or 60 people coming along to this seminar. And I would tackle difficult topics such as spiritual warfare, or sometimes another person would do end times. But we would take topics they would never tackle in church and we'd do them on Tuesday nights. That only stopped because the person organising it got too busy to keep on organising it and I'm not an organiser. People want the power. They want, the, they want to be healed. They want to feel God at work in their hearts. They want to have a sense of connection with a pastoral team. They want to have supportive pastoral and biblical counselling and life coaching. Life coaching is something I uh, used to do professionally. My professional background is in uh, career counselling uh, and management. And so I've done life coaching and I find people, Christians, are very surprised to find that the Bible actually applies to their work environment. That the Bible has a work ethic, that God can speak into their work environment and that really strengthens their faith when they find out that that this is the case, that God can turn up at work and like there's such a thing as Christian life coaching. Prayer for healing, exorcism, house cleansing, life rituals, baptisms, wedding, funeral, covered that to be part of the amazing story of God's glory. Now, all of us, deep down in ourselves, want to be part of a story of glory. The young boy growing up thinks war is glamorous because he can go and he can beat up the terrorists or, or whatever, and he can be part of a story of glory. Uh, the young girl growing up uh, thinks uh, perhaps in another story of glory or career story or being a great artist or actor or part of some romantic story. But we all want to be part of a story of glory. We can be a part of God's story of glory. We can't do that so well online. We can do it well in the local church if the church has a vision for Christianity beyond turning up in the pews. 
So we need, to, this is why I'm in missions. I love the adventure of missions. I love the places I've been. I've been into Banda Aceh after the tsunami came through in 2004 and wiped out 100,000 people. Saw 10,000 tonne boats five miles inland sitting on top of houses. I've been in Muslim areas. I've had kidnap attempts on my life. Uh, this is big part of the story is, is an exciting and wonderful thing. So what are some of the radical adjustments we need to make? Has anyone got any questions before I rattle on forever? No? Keep going. First, we need to preach to transform and not just to inform. Now, we can't get rid of preaching. I'd love to get rid of preaching. I'd like to throw it right out the window. I think it doesn't work. One of the things that I used to talk about as a career counsellor is the, the two rules. Do more of what works for you and stop doing the stuff that doesn't work for you. If it works, do more of it. If it doesn't work, stop doing it. Uh, and it's a very simple two rules. And I'd like to teach that to every pastor because the sermon is not working. So get rid of it. <laughs> Toss it out the window, put it online. They can watch it uh, when they get home. Uh, they, they, they don't need to be in the building to be preached at. Bring them into the room, have them pray together for one another. Have them worship together, have the glory come down. I'm Pentecostal, do the healing thing, do the tongues sing, do whatever that community of faith uh, happens. Break them off into small groups, have them minister to one another and learn the Bible in context of action because we need action and reflection. And then you can go back home and download this, uh, a, a teaching segment which you can reflect on. Great, do it, but get rid of the sermon. But the, we're stuck with it. Uh, people expect to it. But when we preach, we need to preach to connect and to transform, not just to inform and put information in people's heads. Information is dead. The other thing is preach longer until you get a tangible result. The old 20-minute homily did not produce a tangible result most of the time. Now the preachers that are getting the big crowds are preaching 45 minutes to an hour. You go down to Steve Mays in Calvary Chapel, South Bay. You go to Chuck Smith uh, at Costa Mesa. You go to the other preachers around the place. They're preaching 45 minutes to an hour. They're preaching to get a result and they're preaching until that person is immersed in the Word of God. Focus Sundays on powerful worship and on prayer for the sick and on hearing from God, which I touched on earlier. Put complex topics on a website or in seminar style in service courses and not Sunday morning. If I was to tackle homosexuality, on from, I would not tackle it from the pulpit. You cannot tackle that even in 45 minutes. It's a huge, complex, multifaceted topic with many different angles to it. And walking through it with any degree of sensitivity is a two or three hour thing. It has to be done in a seminar. You just can't say, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner, here's our three points of homosexuality and walk out. It's not going to work. It's too complex. Uh, and so those kind of things you have to do in seminar style or in a series of online teachings. Uh, if we want to regularly pray for people and lay hands on them and get them to experience God's very personal touch in their lives, and we pray powerfully and with authority, people need to hear other people praying. I teach on prayer incessantly. It's one of the things I teach on because uh, I just don't think we're taught to pray properly. I think people are just uh, have very little authority and power in prayer. Deliberately create community and spiritual relationships. Uh, the other role of the pastor is to be listener in chief. I find that in Western society and particularly in American society, I know I'm an outsider, I know I'm an Australian, but Americans are very hungry to be listened to. No one listens to them that much. When, I, when people realize that I will sit down in my lounge room or in my office and I will gladly listen to someone for two or three hours, I get bombarded with people to the point where I have to create boundaries. I love hearing people's life stories. And often someone will come to me who's 50, 60 years old and they will say, I'm the first, you're the first person I've talked to about this. 
Um, you're the first person I've talked to about my childhood. You're the first person who's really listened to me in my entire life. Because our community is broken down, our families are broken down, the families are not safe places. And so as a listener in chief, you don't have to teach that much. You don't have to give them answers for their problems. But you could just sit there and listen and listen and listen and listen until they receive the insight on what they're saying. Uh, there's no, no one hears you scream in cy cyberspace, as it says here. And there's this desperate need to be de deeply listened to over a period of time. But some people I've worked with for two, three, four or five years, every week, listening to them. People of, who are very, very ordinary people. I don't just, some pastors, uh, Chop between this is an important person, a leader, I will listen to them. This is an unimportant person, uh, he or she, I'm not going to give her this person my time. I just say, Lord, who do you want me to listen to? And even if that person is demanding and difficult and never will be a leader or, or particularly important, I will hang on with them until the Lord says to do otherwise. I don't take on everybody. Uh, the pastor who truly listens will gain great loyalty and influence. And you have to discern out neurotic attention seekers, of course, and things like that. Okay. The other thing is to be a questioner in chief. And this is very difficult and requires a lot of tact. But if you ask people the right questions and you ask them consistently, not just how are you, but how is your spiritual life? How is your prayer life? How are you going at reading the Bible? These are intrusive questions. But if you've got the relationship established, asking those intrusive strategic questions can really prompt growth. So you can say to someone, hey, how's it going for you? How is your prayer life? How are you walking with God? I notice that you sometimes get very offended. Why is that? Why are you getting offended? And, and they'll look at you and say, well, you know, I'm very brutally tough on people. Uh, I will say there is no reason to be offended. Offendedness is a sign of immaturity and you've got to get over it. And, ah! <laughs> but I'll do that in the context of love. Uh, and you can help people to a greater level of maturity. Do you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe, you know, etc.? God asks questions as well. People want to be questioned in an appreciative manner. They want someone to know them. Who are you? Where are you going? What do you think your gifts are? What's God been speaking to you about? Okay, God's spoken this to you. What are you doing in response to what God said to you? Uh, and uh, those kind of questions. Another thing that we have to model in ministry is to be the crazy guy in chief, the bold way out their faith. We are all inspired by people like that guy that did the jump from the balloon, Baumgartner. Felix Baumgartner, I don't know if you remember him from Red Bull thing. He went up into outer space, he jumped up, uh, put a space suit on and jumped 120,000 feet down to Earth uh, about a year ago or so. That's inspiring. He's way out there. He's done that. He spent 20 years planning it. He did it. We're, we're inspired by people that go and climb Ever, Everest even though they've got a disability. We're inspired by pastors who do something different. Peter walking on the water, Peter going to the Gentiles, P Peter doing all this risk taking. So as a leader, if you stay a little bit ahead of the sheep and you take the risks and your risk taking pays off, then they will follow you and be encouraged to take risks. But you have to not be too far out, but you need to be the far out risk taker. You need to tell adventure stories, stretch their boundaries, do stuff that they can't find uh, on the internet. Demonstrate real power in prayer and healing, not fake stuff. And be a living example of God turning up in real time. So people are longing to really experience God. On the internet, you don't really experience God. You can have a nice touch in your heart. I do a nice Facebook post. It'll make you feel great. But really experiencing God takes other people. And people want God to turn up and mess with them. They really do. 
They say they don't want it, but they really do want it. <laughs> People want God to turn up and mess with them. Uh, you know, I have had some very powerful spiritual experiences in my life. I don't talk about them much, but they have been transformational. I've had powerful dreams, powerful visions, times when I've seen things in the spirit realm that have changed the whole way that I've done my Christian faith. Uh, it's not just an intellectual e enterprise. I remember I went through a very dark, I'll tell you about one. I went through a very dark period in my life, uh, extremely deep betrayal in my life. Uh, and I was mad at God, at the world, at everything. This is about 1995, quite a while ago. Uh, and uh, I was so angry uh, that... Uh, I just couldn't face life, I couldn't face God, I couldn't face church. And uh, I had this vision, almost like an open vision, of the glassy sea of heaven. The throne was way off in the distance and there was this little insect about half the size of the front half of a fly. And this little insect was going... I got, and being furious at God. And I realised that in insect was me. Uh, and I realized that I had to get God's perspective on my futile rage, that all it was was futile rage. It wasn't going to do any good to anybody. It was just futile rage. Uh, and that turned me around. I was, you know, very dark. I was almost suicidal. I wasn't suicidal, but I was close to it. And that turned me around. From that point on, my spiritual life changed. My attitude to God changed. And I just took off in a new burst of spiritual life. Uh, it's those kinds of things when God just interrupts your own flow and says, hey, this is who you are, really. This is, get your act together. Now, God's pretty brutal with me. He can be brutal with me. <laughs> but there's, there's times like that uh, when, when spiritual experiences make a difference. And we need, when we go to church, we should be confronted by God who messes with us and gets us out of our stuff. We want to walk out of church feeling great and knowing that God spoke to us personally and directly and healed us, saved us, changed us and opened heaven to us. We want to have our prayers answered. We want to experience God's love and community. We don't mind very long services if we're seeing our prayers answered and experiencing God in community. And we will tithe and give generously if we have our prayers answered and experience God in community. How many more slides have I got? Okay. Oh boy. I'm going to run out of time. Uh, back I go. Okay. One of the things that we go to church for that we can't get online and which relates to the cyber world is we go to church to be the part of the story of God's glory. And there is a story that is unfolding. I touched on this earlier. We go to church, we go to this community to become part of the unfolding of the kingdom of God in a new way. I'm going to church not just to get my little emotional needs met or my informational needs met, that church is a little community that's part of God's community, which is part of his kingdom, which is doing something. And I'm very happy that our church does things in the community, that we see people saved, we see people healed. We have a feeding program. We have a laundry love program where we go down to the local laundromat and pay for people's laundry to be done. We become a part of the story of God's glory in that community. And that story will be different for every church. Some churches are good at ministry to the homeless. Other churches are good uh, at ministry to missions. I was part of a church in Australia. We only had 45 members in this tiny little church. 15 of those people became CEOs of missionary societies, including myself. Uh, one of them is now the provost of Fuller. Uh, and there's other people that have made significant contributions came out of the church. It, its story was a story of missions. Other churches are very good at inner healing and soul uh, and soul healing. It's, uh, others are very good at dealing with demons and things like that. We need to understand that my role as a pastor or as an elder 
And your role in church is transformation, not just information. The internet is wonderful at giving us information. It is lousy at producing transformation. And so we can say, okay, get your information from the internet, but come here to be changed. And we, need, we want to be, have a goal of doing a deeper work in the life of every congregant and adopt highly relational ways of doing Christianity. Now, here's, here's my central challenge, and it's a bit of a, a, a long time getting to it. If God doesn't show up, then the internet will absolutely decimate the local church and send it right. I'll repeat that. If God doesn't show up, then the internet will absolutely decimate the local church and send it broke. No one is going to pay to attend church to get stuff they can get online. That's the basic business model. No one's going to bother. No one's going to put $50, $100 in the pulpit each week to get stuff they can get for free online. So if the church remains an information repository, it's dead. It's finished not going to happen because people aren't going to spend the time and they're not going to spend the money they're not going to pay the pastor it will just collapse and the internet will spread immorality it will spread false doctrine and it will just eat the church up but i don't think that's going to happen <laughs> right but if god doesn't turn up that's where it's going Church needs to eventually shift to being very human, very spiritual, very connected and deeply transformational as these are the unique points that will differentiate the local church from the computer screen. The computer screen can give me all the information I want, all the entertainment I want, all the stories I want, all the worship music I want, but it can't transform me as deeply as human community can. I can only really be changed by community. So... If you're talking in marketing terms, what's the selling point? What's the unique benefit of the local church in its community? It's community, it's love. It's those 33 love one another commands. Now doctrine remains vital, but it needs to be reframed as part of our equipping for the amazing adventure of Christ. Doctrine is not the point of church. You can put the doctrine online. Ministry training needs to focus on being able to make things happen just as Jesus did. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons his training was focused on making things happen in people's lives the pastor needs to be able to make stuff happen by the power of God now that's really threatening to me in ministry I don't like saying that because it puts an accountability on me I don't want when I pray for the sick it means they have to get well when I pray for someone who has uh, in a certain life situation, it should make a difference to that life situation. Now, it's God's responsibility to answer the prayer, of course. And I'm not some super powerful person. I do see some healing. I do see some change. But why is someone going to go to a pastor if that pastor makes no difference? If being prayed for is just a sentimental thing that makes them feel better, if there is no real change, why bother going to the pastor? If I say God's got power, I'd better prove it. I'd better heal the sick. I'd better raise the... I've never raised the dead, but I've healed a lot of sick people. I've done a lot of exorcism because of my tradition. Uh, the main, you know the main thing that I'm asked to do for people? Break curses of people's lives. People say, I know, you're the guy that breaks curses. Oh, okay. am I really? <laughs> That's my reputation all over the world, the guy that breaks curses off people's lives. A lot of cultures, people get jealous, people get angry, they curse someone with, you know, using witchcraft. Uh, I wrote an article on curses years and years ago uh, and how to deal with them. And suddenly I'm the guy that breaks curses because I make a difference in people's lives. I say, this is how to pray, here's, here's your information, here's some teaching on curses, here's a prayer, da 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 da. Because I'm making a difference at that point. Now don't ask me to pray for your finances, I'm hopeless at praying for finances. But I'm good at praying for other things. And so, the, uh, the pastor has to actually make a difference. And you have to accept the responsibility that you're there to make a difference in people's lives. 
You're not just there to make them feel good, feel them reassured, put a little bit of information in their head. If they turn up and they're sick and you pray for them and they don't get well, you failed and God's failed and the church has failed and I'll go to the internet and watch YouTube videos. Because they're desperate for real help. Okay, no strategic plan can shift us out of where we are to where we need to be. We need to spend bulk time with God and get a far deeper anointing, powerful God by love and a commitment to growing human souls into the glory of God. I see lots of churches who are struggling and they say, oh, we're going to rebrand the church. We're going to get a new logo. We're going to get a, a new tagline. Well, we're, we're going to get this. Uh, we're, we're going to have a new church sign uh, and we're going to have a strategic plan for the church and that's going to solve our problem. It's not going to solve your problem. If you haven't got the power of God, you haven't got the power of God. And if you haven't got the power of God, people are going to say, why bother? And that's a very logical, sensible thing for them to say. Why bother turning up in a building when nothing's happening? They might as well go to the beach and have nothing happen there. Costs a lot less money, a lot more pleasant. So it's a, they're just making a rational decision. If they're going to church and paying a lot of money, a lot of time for nothing to happen, then go somewhere else. People don't need warm fuzzies from the past. They can get warm fuzzies from TV. They don't need jokes from the past. There's better comedians on YouTube. They need something to happen. Even if it's as simple as my wife's faith in God being restored by her Friday night group that she belongs to and they, and they love her to bits, Something's happened. Minda feels the difference. Something good is going on. It might be spectacular on the outside, but it's spectacular on the inside. And boy, am I appreciating it as a husband. Uh, so there's, something's got to happen. If pe and if nothing's happening, nothing's happening, close up shop, go home. We've got to start making things happen. And we'll only get that spiritual stuff happening because that's all we've got to offer as a church is the spiritual stuff. We'll only get that spiritual stuff happening if we spend bulk time with God. We have to value community more than privacy and be more open to our congregants. We have to reframe the task of spiritual participation in a divine story, not just dumping information. Okay. I'm nearly out of time. Yeah, I am. Uh, let's forget about that. Let's just go back a couple... That's, that's, I'll leave up my information there and I'll, I'll wind up. Uh, we have a challenge whereby the whole nature of church is what we call the technical word is disintermediated. The church has been cut out of the loop. You can go directly to someone else instead of through the past, instead of through the local church, and you can get that information you can get your ordination, you can get your theological training, you can find your Christian husband or wife without going to church. A lot of people, Christians go to church in order to find a partner. Right? When they're young, I'll go to a youth group, I'll find a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Why do you have to go to the youth group when you can go to Christian Mingle? Right? So a lot of the old reasons for going to church now are just being blasted out of the water. And we need a new church, a new structure of church that can compete with cyberspace because cyberspace is free it's fast it's immediate you don't have to wait around to sunday morning to get your answer cyberspace will eat the church and it will leave christians very spiritually hungry because people don't realize their need for fellowship until it's too late till they've been drifting around they don't realize they need to be challenged and no one or very few people realize they need to be held to account. Very few people want to be challenged in that way or disciplined. So the local church is going to be eaten up and totally demolished by the internet except for some very traditional people and old ladies that still want to go to a church service within 10 years. Within 10 years, the local churches of America will be broke unless we adapt and incorporate community. Because there is no way that people are going to go to a church for Bible teaching they can get for free online. It's over. That model's done. 
And so we need to say, now that the gospel is ubiquitous, now that information you used to only get at church can be found in books, TV, print, CDs, DVDs, everything else. Now that information is everywhere except inside the church, and you can get it much more immediately, uh, why bother? And that's the central challenge that will absolutely rip the church to pieces, along with legal action, along with all the social challenges of our society. So we need a church that will be robust and community-centered and loving. And I'm gonna put this, this PowerPoint should be on the Biola website afterwards. That's my contact details. Feel free to ask me any questions or email me there. Uh, my email is digitalopportunities at gmail.com. I'd love to interact with you and catch up with you later on. If you're any of you in the LA area, I'm one of those people happy to do Starbucks and, and uh, catch up. So uh, I'm uh, that way. So thank you very much for your time. I'll let you go now and grab your lunches. I'll close in prayer. Father in heaven, you are good and your church is in trouble. But Lord, you know about that trouble. And you are going to help us to find alternative ways of doing church in response to the digital challenge. And Lord, I ask for every person in this room and for myself that you will show us how to reach people for Jesus Christ. And that the internet, Lord, can be used for good and for evil. Let it be part of our strategy, Lord. But let us also preserve your people gathered together to worship you and to love you. And Lord, we ask for wisdom on how to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.